Welcome back to another Player Profiler Dynasty Reddit AMA session. I'm joined today by the Podfather. We're 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 in the Dynasty streets. We recorded Sonic Truth this morning. Now we're back at it, answering your questions. You can get your questions answered right here on YouTube. You can also get your questions answered over on Reddit. The link is posted right on Player Profiler Twitter. Matt, how we doing, man? A lot going on today. Stephon Diggs, Houston Texan. Is he? Is he a Texan? Is that what happened? That's right. uh, so, you know, I, I've yelled at, at Alan already because in the Sonic Truth show, he says, uh, welcome to the Sonic Truth Dynasty focused fantasy football. Po-. And I'm like, Alan, and he's like, it's a joke. It's a joke. It's 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 my funny way of uh, of of being, uh, uh, you know, uh, inefficient with the opening of the show. And I'm like, I don't think anyone's getting this joke. I didn't get this joke. How is anyone supposed to get this joke? And lo and behold. First AMA we get from Jungle or Jung One E, however you want to say it. Jung One E. I kind of that sounds like a uh, a character from uh, Star Wars. Yeah, right? the uh, yeah. The Reddit, I'm, uh, Reddit I'm, I'm heading over to I'm heading over to the the planet Hoth with uh, J One E. Um, he says, "Please stop shoehorning the word focused into the Sonic Truth Dynasty podcast. It bogs down the show. Love it though." And I'm like, that is an elaborate joke. Don't you understand my level of attention to detail would never let Alan do that for more than one show unless he said this is some kind of inside joke that only he knows about. We need to confront Alan on the next Sonic Truth show about this opening and have him streamline it. Yeah, Alan uh, Alan loves saying it. I've called him out on it. And uh, I think Alan likes getting a rise out of people. So he certainly got a rise out of Dude, he's commenter. polluting our freaking AMA now. That's right. Now I have to That's scroll right. extra in this AMA. That's how dare he? Yeah. So these AM these AMA questions, you know, they can be sometimes very intricate, sometimes very short. But this person may maybe really more of an Alan Soslowski uh, comment. But yeah, get your questions in. Dynasty trades. We're reacting to the Stefan Diggs news. Wild, wild uh, to get that this morning. It's sort of like Matt. You know, you've been doing this a long time, but. When you get close to the NFL draft, you never have like a dull day. You have these like you kind of expect there's going to be nothing going on. You know, you schedule, you know, your podcast and then you get this sort of a trade. Um, How excited are you about CJ Stroud this year? I mean, we talked about it. We closed out the show. The funny thing is about I think people on Reddit, they like to kind of go behind the scenes a little bit. And by the way, in, in the comments. We should absolutely. Can, can we can we put a comment up for the for the people? And give them a link to the Reddit. Oh, yeah. I'll put that in right now. I think this should work right here. Let me copy this. They need to know. People need to know where to go to ask these questions. And I close it out because on the fly, information comes in. You got to think about what's the impact. Dalton Schultz, RIP. Nico Collins, RIP. You got to think about what's the, You have five minutes to think it through and to come up with and, and the more I was thinking about it and I was trying to iterate over, okay, what, what, what's the implication? What's the implication? And I was very uh, pleased that by the end of the show, we figured out that the real question moving forward is going to be at what point do you put CJ Stroud, post him up as the one one in Superflex? I mean, it's close. And we also have to factor in, Josh Allen loses not only Stephon Diggs, but he loses Gabe Davis, who scored a ton of touchdowns for him, had a lot of spike weeks for him, and been the sort of guy that could really go off uh, every now and then as a deep threat over the top. And those two guys have been replaced by Curtis Samuel and Mac Hollins. Now, certainly we think Kincaid will take a step forward. Certainly we think we're they're going to draft a wide receiver, maybe see a little more James Cook out of the backfield. But the Buffalo Bills offense is worse than it was when we started the offseason. I'm I'm pretty confident in saying that. There's a Khalil Shakir uh, like hive out there that thinks this could be like Khalil Shakir takes this massive step forward. Like we like Shakir at player profiler, but wanting him to be anything more than like a solid wide receiver three, I think is asking a lot from him. I think it's great for Shakir. This is great. This is all the, the if you were a Khalil Shakir a dynasty manager, I mean, this is all you've ever wanted. This is the reason to be a truth on a guy like that. He has he has a great, you know, possession receiver, body type and skill set and you know production history. It's all there for him, right? He's a better receiver than Gabriel Davis. That's clear. 
I think he's he's a little more explosive, better hands, better route runner. There's so much he other than size is that's really the only thing that Gabriel Davis has on him. And whoever they bring in, what it's more likely to be a rookie than it is a veteran to be the the number one option, right? Yeah, I I agree with you. I think it's uh it's and I've seen like Cody Carpentier tweeted out that he thinks they're gonna try to make a big move up to get like Malik neighbors, and that would just wow. be like forget about it. But I don't see it happening. They pick at 28 overall. They would have to give up next year's first round pick and probably something on top to get into the top five to get like the Harrison Jr., the neighbors. Maybe there's a scenario where Roma Dunze is available at like nine and they pay like a King's ransom to move up to nine. Uh, Jets pick at 10. Jets are not going to help out the Bills. So I don't know, Matt. It's uh, it's a, it's a really weird situation um, it seems kind of short-sighted by Buffalo. Now NFL teams know that they need a wide receiver. So, you know, you know how this goes. When you have this massive need, any team behind them that wants a wide receiver is going to know that they have to trade up right ahead of Buffalo. So it makes everything more expensive for Buffalo. Um, I would have liked to have seen them make a move earlier this offseason and bring in somebody that we have a little bit more confidence on. So I have a good question in the in the AMA chat from Bronton21. Uh, between the wide receivers, are there uh, draft day scenarios that exist where you're taking Malik Neighbors or Rome Adunze over Marvin Harrison? And then the follow-up was also, how much conviction um, do you have on wide receiver four and wide receiver five in this class? Why don't we start out with, Matt, is there a scenario where a, a landing spot for Marvin Harrison Jr. You you could see that you would hate, and maybe a Malik Neighbors situation that you would love. And if they both happen, you're ready to make the switch. I mean, the regret factor and the overthink factor is just too high, right? Marvin Harrison was posted up as the wide receiver one, the potential 101, even in Superflex, for the last three years. This guy is going to be at least 210 pounds standing 6'3". He's a mega producer. The comps are anywhere from A.J. Green to Julio Jones to Andre Johnson. Okay. Yeah. I don't care where he lands. <laughs> Drake London was in a terrible situation until he wasn't. This is dynasty. We had these guys for their careers. You have this golden opportunity to draft like a – the best receiver since Jamar Chase and now between Jamar Chase and Marvin Harrison as prospects, it's debatable. We're not going to have any workout data. So the answer is easy. Jamar Chase, because he gave us a lot more data, but without the workout data, whoo, that's a close call. That's a close call. And actually Marvin Harrison has, <laughs> has the, has the size advantage on even Jamar Chase. So, the idea that I could look back and be like, I had a chance to draft Marvin Harrison and I took another receiver instead. I just, I, no, I, I, I can't imagine a scenario other than absolute best case scenario for neighbors and absolute worst case scenario for Harrison, where I would even consider it. Worst case scenario for Harrison is probably new England at three. New England says, I don't like the, any of the quarterbacks at the end of the day. I'm going to try take the best player maybe on our board in the entire NFL draft in Marvin Harrison Jr. And then we could see Malik Neighbors land in like Arizona or Los Angeles with Kyler Murray and Justin Herbert. I think if that happens, maybe I'm taking Malik Neighbors ahead of uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. But I think it comes down to how close do you see Neighbors and Marvin Harrison Jr.? And I think they're both like truly, truly elite. It's going to be hard for me to see a Dunze jump to wide receiver one in this scenario. I love Roma Dunze, but I do see him as the wide receiver three in this class. But it's 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 truly special. I have uh, recorded a, a Dynasty Life with uh, Thor Nystrom, and we were talking about – we had, and we had the same conversation we had on Sonic Truth about how Roma Dunze, wide receiver three in this class, would be the one, wide receiver one in the past two classes. Uh, it's, it's really, really an awesome uh, class. Another question, Matt, we got to get to. Well, what, and, what would be the scenario, though? T tell me the scenario. Where would Harrison have to go? Uh, New, England. New England. Where would neighbors have to go? Arizona. And then you're like, I'll go neighbors. Arizona. Give me okay. Arizona. So neighbors goes to Arizona. 
Harrison goes to New England, you're going to draft neighbors over Harrison. I'm going to think about it. I think that the devil's advocate that, hey, Theo, you're wrong, is this is an elite player landing in a situation where there's no one preventing him from getting 150 targets as a rookie, even if the quality of the offense is poor. Jacoby Brissett could uh, support a stud wide receiver. Um, so there's, uh, I, I, I would just, it would, I would be more inclined to think about it, Matt. I don't know when a push comes to shove, we tell the greatest truths in fantasy football when we're actually on the clock. And I think when I'm on the clock in my rookie drafts, I, I probably, I would really want just like more split exposure. I know that's like the cop out answer for somebody who has a lot of dynasty teams. No, but man, you can't say that. I can't do that. I'm not you allowed can't to do say that, that with normal yeah. people. Reddit is normal people. Well, normal people that are super, super, super intense about fantasy football, which is who I love, except they're so intense that sometimes they boomerang like some comments back on me that end up, you know, causing problems. I, I digress. Okay. Sure. Uh, th th these are my people. We have a complicated relationship, right? This is one of those couples, me and Reddit. It's it's kind of like, yeah, it's one of those volatile relationships where both the woman and the man party a lot. They both have very strong personalities. Right. Um, and they have they have wild and crazy sex when it's good and they have huge, uh, you know, yelling matches when it's going badly. That's me and Reddit. Uh, but that's partly because of there, there's some there's a, there's a simpatico relationship there where like you guys are too similar. Right. That's why that couple is never going to work out in the long run. They're too similar. You need to have you need to have some opposite uh, opposite sensibilities. And then there's more of a mesh. So part of the reason I don't mesh that well with Reddit is because you, you, you people are too much like me. Uh, that's 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 actually a little little Reddit take there. Uh, Walsh, your mouth out is asking if hoarding QBs in single quarterback is a good idea in rookie drafts. And the answer is absolutely not. Um, in, in any draft, startups, whatever, there's never a, a strong market. Unless you're talking about, it's got to be at least 16 teams. And even then, most people are going to talk themselves into finding value uh, the next Ryan Tannehill, the next Kirk Cousins, the next quarterback that gets plucked off the waiver wire in single quarterback leagues, they're going to talk themselves into that one and think they can get the 18 fantasy points a game from somebody eventually. And, you know, at, at the expense of the guy that's giving them 22 fantasy points a game. That's the math that a lot of people do. And that's why you can go ahead and burn a bunch of roster spots, hoarding a bunch of quarterbacks in single QB but I don't know if you're that's going to you're, you're going to crowd out a lot of potential pickups that you could make. And, you know, most of the deals that you offer, including where you're including a quarterback, they're not moving the needle. So what are you doing? You have a bunch of roster space devoted to a position that doesn't move the needle on any given trade unless you're going to move one of the elite guys. And OK, so now you're playing a game of I'm going to draft a bunch of quarterbacks. And I'm going to take big shots, big swings on Josh Allen type profiles. And maybe one of them hits and then I can maybe flip them. I mean, that is just a complicated, wasteful game to play that I don't think has an, enough ROI to even be worth considering. We have a great question in the chat from Shane DePoe. And get your trade questions right here in the chat or over on Reddit. But this is a really uh, an easy one, Matt. One quarterback... 10 team league would you trade javante williams and hollywood brown for garrett wilson i'm doing that trade all day and twice on sundays in a 10 team league especially i want to have access to guys that i think could put up elite fantasy seasons and there's only one player in this deal that i think could put up like a truly special fantasy season in 2024 and that's garrett wilson and also garrett wilson is by far the best dynasty asset in this situation. Anything to add, or is that you agree with that one? No, I agree with that. Okay, so let's move on. One more, uh, Matt. You take this one because this has been a Podfather favorite, Zamir White, and now Matt, you have Josh Jacobs gone from Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. uh, Andrew Dallum in the chat wants to know your thoughts on Zamir White for just next year. So you don't need to take a a look at how he's going to do for his whole career. But does he have a pathway in 2024 to helping our fantasy teams win? 
Yeah, Zamir White is going to be, you know, why can't he be Kenneth Walker? Uh, yeah, running back 18 sounds about right. If they don't, unless they, <laughs> unless they draft, like there's like five guys, and we did this last year where Matt, Matt and I sat along around and uh, same speed, same yeah. size. One guy just was at Georgia in a split backfield. The other guy had the, the backfield all to himself at, at Michigan State. What the hell's the difference? What's the difference to those guys? They're they're between the tackles, grinders with explosive ability when they can they can hit a crease and score a touchdown on any crease, any day, any week, any moment in an NFL game. You give them a crease, they can score a touchdown. That's why they're not normal grinders. That's why they're not Carlos Hyde. They have more upside than that. Right? That's why that's what you like about Nick Chubb. Is he Nick Chubb? No. Right? He's a lesser Nick Chubb. What's a lesser Nick Chubb? Look around the league. Kenneth Walker. That's what a lesser and, and so you're you're gonna get the 20 to 30 catches in a workhorse role, 10 plus touchdowns always in play. And what could hurt his 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 value is they draft a running back. Are they gonna draft a running back? Yes, they just lost Josh Jacobs. So what you always have to remember is general managers don't think like fantasy managers. Okay, the general manager in Houston is thinking about the fact that, hey, we're losing Robert Woods. We don't have any premium wide receivers in our in a, we have a, we have an undersized third rounder. We have a late blooming, big lumbering third rounder. You know, we don't have any high pedigree wide receivers. We're losing veterans. We need to invest in the wide receiver position. Fantasy gamers are like, why would you do that? You're fine. Look, haven't you looked at the fantasy numbers? You're fine, right? Houston's not thinking that way, okay? I would love to somehow get the communication across the desk of the people in Las Vegas. Hey, you have Zamir White. You're fine. I can guarantee you don't feel they don't feel that way, right? They're feeling like this is a weak point, and they need to make sure they backfill you know, with, with, with good players. An interesting you know, Dylan Lobb there would be interesting. Any of the satellite backs from this class would be interesting there. An interesting combination that doesn't hurt Zamir too much, but there's also going to be, you know, there's there's opportunity there to work with. So that would hurt him, right? So they go ahead and draft. Oh, who who who, who, who do you think they would draft that would that would be a problem? Oh, I can name a couple guys that I think would be like really bad for Zamir White. Uh, I mean, we know Braylon Allen would be bad. Yeah, Braylon Allen would be bad. But do you think they would draft Braylon Allen? No, but I worry about Jalen Wright. Um, I think Jalen Wright could be the kind of guy that could come in and, and kind of nuke Zamir White a little bit. Um, no. I, I worry about Marshawn Lloyd a little bit. Uh, Braylon Allen would certainly be scary for Zamir White with the, the goal line opportunities. Uh, I, I I really want to see. About... I'm thinking more of Bucky Irving. I'm thinking that I think that's the direction they're going to go. I think they're going to be more inclined to upgrade the Amir Abdullah role um, and and go with a Bucky Irving, go with a, a Dylan Lobb. That's my hope. Anyway, I could just be hope trafficking on that. And it turned, but, but Jalen Wright is a slasher or right? Jalen yeah. Wright doesn't have anything on, you know, in, in terms of, you know, as a runner, there's no, I, I wouldn't be afraid of Jalen Wright if I'm Zamir White, right? And Jalen Wright has what 30 receptions in his college career. So I think that's, that's not, that's not a guy that he's going to be a rookie. He's going to be learning the playbook. He's going to be learning the, the, how to attack NFL defenses. So you, and, and Zamir White's a seasoned guy. They're both these explosive between the tackles, runners, slashers. One guy's a little more Jalen Wright, more of a slasher. Zamir White, more of a prototypical workhorse. So those are some of the backs. See, I, I, my larger point is there aren't that, even if you say Jalen Wright, my argument would be, well, Zamir White's going to have the backfield to himself this year, and they're just going to mix in Jalen Wright because he's a rookie, and that's what normally happens. And then if it's a satellite back, there's not that much uh, overlap anyway. So what good could happen to Zamir White? Well, the good thing would be they upgrade the quarterback position. They add a Michael Penix, right? Or they move up and they draft someone, some some quarterbacks, some of the big four quarterbacks fall that we're not expecting, and uh, they end up with one of the big four quarterbacks somehow. 
See, that's a situation where all of a sudden Devontae Adams is more productive. The whole offense is 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 is, is now dangerous. Where you have Devontae Adams on one side, you have Jacoby Myers, a, a great possession receiver on the other. You have, you know, potentially Michael Mayer uh, taking a step forward. Suddenly, this is a productive offense. Suddenly, Zamir White, that's what you want. You don't want a between the tackles guy on a bad offense. Right. Guys, want to clarify one thing. It's not a boredom look, guys. I'm trying to type in on Reddit as I'm as I'm, you know, talking to Matt. Uh, so it's 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 always a difficult. I told Matt like the uh, we've been doing these for a few weeks. Come join us every single week right here. We're streaming these AMAs, but it's always a challenge to kind of type and talk. So I, I love having uh, Matt join me. Josh Larkey joined me two weeks ago. Done a few with Dario. But uh, communication breakdown in the chat wants to know our thoughts of Andre Yoshivas. Looks great on player profile. Yeah, he definitely looks great on player profile because athletically he's extremely uh, gifted. This was a guy that tested kind of through the roof. He was a Bruce Feldman's freaks list guy, which that's really significant for an Ivy League player to end up on that list heading into his senior season uh, at Princeton. And he had some spike weeks. He had a two touchdown game, I believe, the last week of the season. Uh, certainly has a path. I, he's sort of a I like him better in best ball type guy because uh, you don't have to predict the weeks. But if if the T Higgins situation falls apart, he could have some weekly usage this year, but I think more likely he's a, uh, the third wide receiver. And also I think it would be good for him to dodge a Brock Bowers bullet, which could come in the NFL draft. If he falls, I think since Cincinnati could move up for Bowers, but Yoshi bus is, is definitely an interesting one. Well, we, we so Higgins is on a one year deal this year, right? Yeah. 20 plus million dollars. Just a straight up like one year. That's it. Wants a trade on a deal. Wants a call. I mean, it's his way of saying, give me more money or give me a longer contract. But the Higgins camp wants out. Um, well, clearly they want out. Yeah. There, there was a one year deal. I like their. Uh, this is a. This is the way to go. By the way, this this is the way to go, which is to just you know take the one year deal, report to camp, don't hold out. Do it this franchise tag or a one year deal, whatever it is. Hey, we all know that that I'm not in this organization's plans longer term. I want to be the alpha somewhere. All good, man. All good. Like I want to be the front man. I don't want to be in this band anymore. I want to have my own band or I want to go solo. Fine. Fine. But I'm going to go ahead and put the work in and put great tape together and put great metrics out there and go try to win a championship for a year in good faith. And that will also endear me to the other 31 NFL general managers. But this is why holding out rarely works out. It's a scheme that the agents, I believe, talk the players into. And I'm all about player empowerment. I have enough street cred in the player empowerment topic. Uh, but just from a, a pure pragmatism standpoint, right? If you're just trying to be pragmatic about the, the topic, given the rules the way they are, especially now with the, the the fines for missed practices and missed games, it doesn't make any sense to even talk about it, to even to even bring it up in the media. Forget it, right? It's just it's, it's the, the the collective bargaining agreement. It, it was anti-player. We know it. You, we, so the, the, we, you either accept it and you try to get the best deal you can, the most money you can in your career in the, in, you, 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 with a rational plan of attack, or you, know, you try to fall on a sword you know, on behalf of your agent for no fucking reason, right? So I, 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 I appreciate the situation that these, these players find themselves in, and I also understand when someone comes out right away like a Tony Pollard and just says, I'll take the franchise tag. I'm good. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work hard. I'm going to get paid next year. No big deal. T Higgins going to Buffalo would be interesting. Oh, T Higgins goes to Buffalo and it's Miller time. I mean, you're right? talking about you get 140 target T Higgins season with, you know, attached to arguably the best quarterback in football in Josh Allen 
I mean, that would be like a meteoric. It would actually be kind of similar to when Stefan Diggs went from Minnesota to Buffalo and we all of a sudden saw his targets just go through the roof. I believe uh, Diggs had never been targeted more than 130 times, gets targeted 150 plus out the gate, goes from like a low end wide receiver two to a top three wide receiver. I don't know if T Higgins would be a top five wide receiver, but I think he'd be a no. wide receiver one though. I think he'd, he would finish as a wide receiver one as the wide receiver one in Buffalo. I think he'd get enough high value t- uh, targets and I think he'd get enough total targets that we've already seen T. T Higgins sort of perform well. I think he would take that next step if he if he was acquired by Buffalo. Well, he would not- at least give you he would give you the spike weeks that Gabriel Davis gave you, yeah, you know, twice as often. Right, he's I- still going to do what T Higgins does. He's going to give you some one for eight weeks. There's going to be some defenses that take him away. There's going to be some defenses that. They basically say, "Hey, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna push T Higgins off to the side. We're gonna make Josh Allen check it down and beat us." And that's often how the Bills lose when when defenses put Josh Allen in that situation. He just is too stubborn. So that's the type of player he's gonna be. He's always if he went to Buffalo, even though it seems like he's be getting consistent targets, I still think he'd be a better best ball candidate and be you'd be set up to be heartbroken uh, in in the playoffs with with some kind of like th- you know three fantasy points from a T Higgins in week 16. That's something, you know, would happen. Right. And I would, I would actually find it funny. Uh, but, uh, uh, I also wanted to wrap up on Zamir white for all those reasons. I actually think the draft, it, it could help Zamir white more than it hurts him, especially if it paves the way for the Raiders to have a big quarterback upgrade. And then for that reason, because I'm generally bullish on Zamir white, I actually am. I'm more bullish than people think on these fast between the tackles runners, because I think there's some hidden upside there with long touchdowns that doesn't get properly factored in uh, the, any given season. They can score a bunch of these long touchdowns. And then all of a sudden it's a 13 touchdown year. It's like, Whoa, how's that possible? Well, because you know, they scored two or three of them from the 50 yard line. So I'm going to be ahead of market and trying to be getting as much Zamir white as I can given his ADP in all formats. There's no downside to hoarding as much Zamir white as you can. Uh, I think the upside eclipses the downside pretty easily there. Um, let's look at another. Well, let's another take this quick one on Reddit. the on the board. D- uh, let's do this one on uh, the YouTube chat, then we'll get right back to Reddit. Dylan Gibson, one quarterback league, 209 and a 2025 first. And he's saying that his team is good. So let's call it the 110 in 2025 mm-hmm. or Rashi Rice. Seems actually about right. I think I could make an argument for both sides here. I like, you know, you're getting the 2025 first. I, I think, first of all, like the whole notion of trading future first, even if your team is strong, a lot of times that pick you think is the 111 can still turn into the 106. So you have to factor that in a little bit. Um, happens all the time. All the time. And I think that, uh, I think it was Jordan McNamara. Uh, made the comment you know, a couple years back that just treat all future first round picks as the 107 in your thinking because usually 106 107 is a good better way of thinking about it. Who's than, the 107 like, this year in Superflex? JJ oh. McCarthy. Well, this is one QB league, so one QB league oh. just becomes less valuable. Oh, um, I, I think I might. Ooh, I would do it. I think it's Rashi Rice. Ooh, for ooh, me. Ooh. No, but that's a great that's a great one because. I would not do it in Superflex because I want that pick. Those picks are so valuable, especially if it's the 105, 106, 107, 108, 109. We talked about it in the Sonic Truth show that I actually love the 109, even though people are terrified of it because they're like, well, I, you know, a Dunze is going to go and I'm going to be screwed in Superflex. You know, this is huge. I mean, I've never seen. The Bowers of Dunze, JJ McCarthy drop down to whoever you have as the ninth overall player in rookie drafts is crazy. <laughs> but that's okay. I'm going to take that pick knowing someone ahead of me is going to make a mistake. And I'm going to get a, 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 a top eight player. That's why it's a fun pick to have. We talked about that. Uh, but I, I, I want that. I want that ammunition, right? You More often than not, you trade a first round, you're going to regret it. Uh, and if the other thing is, 
Don't forget, there's a lot of scenarios where Rashi Rice takes a step back this year, not having anything to do with the suspension. That, you know, maybe there's this this, this pretty in, uh, incredible connection between Pat Mahomes and Marquise Brown. Maybe uh, Travis Kelsey was, was hiding an injury. And then Rashi Rice this year, you know, ends up operating as the number three option. That would that would stink. Right? That's not what we think is going to happen, but that's a possibility. Or so many of these wide receivers in year two, for whatever reason, they regress and they bounce back in their third year. But there's a lot of possibilities where you're looking up, going, "Damn it, I could have had a first rounder," uh, you know, in 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 super flex. That you really have to do a lot to pry those 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 first rounders and super flex out from my uh, dead cold fingers. But if you already have a good team and it's one quarterback, think about who that would be this year. The one oh nine in single quarterback. That's like what one of the Texas receivers. Yeah, it's I mean, 109, 109 in single this year could be. Yeah, I think you, you yeah, kind of nailed Xavier it. Worthy, not, that's Xavier Worthy, Adonai, Adonai, Adonai Mitchell, Adonai Mitchell and, or Blake Lad, Corum. It, Lad it, it's a running, a running back. back. Yep. It's one of the top couple running backs. Say the, say the RB3 on your board, right? It's Jalen Wright or one of the Texas receivers. Nah, man. No way. No, you don't do it. You, 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 don't, you don't care that much. Give me Rashi Rice, baby. Do we have any concerns? Question in the chat here from from football, football Allah's 06. Is there any concern about Caleb Williams being a sort of a different kind of guy? I think it's a little overblown. I think he's a truly uh, elite player. Uh, and draft him at the 101 and roll the dice because the upside's great. I think it's the upside. I mean, it's not just great. I think Caleb Williams is in that Andrew Luck Trevor Lawrence level of can't miss at the at the quarterback spot and being emotional after losses and things like that. I don't think that's going to matter at all. I think this is a guy that every chance Caleb Williams has has had to start somewhere. He's done it at a, a young level, started in high school as a freshman at a really big time high school program, forces Spencer Rattler to transfer out of Oklahoma, takes that job then goes to USC and wins the Heisman. Don't overthink it with Caleb. Uh, one more question. Wait, wait, wait. Since when Since when has the personality of a player or quarterback held them back? Haven't we seen a long list of different personalities come through the NFL? Think about it. We've had guys that were, uh, you know, uh, super religious. We've had guys that were weird. We've had guys that, you know, We've had guys like Cam Newton that didn't that refused to stretch with their teammates, right? Where he would walk around while they were stretching and make fun of them, <laughs> right? And he was an elite fantasy producer for what eight years? Yeah, I mean, at, at least his rookie year, right? So post rookie year, <laughs> Cam Newton had some of the most uh, dynasty value of any player. It, it, in, even in single quarterback. So I'm not worried about it, man. I'm not worried about it. You, you, there's all different kinds of guys, right? Aaron Rodgers has a personality that, you know, where, where he's going into caves that are dark and he's coming out and, and, and he's, uh, you know, he, he's getting political. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, we've, we've got, pff, I mean, ideally, you get a Jalen Hurts personality, right? That's best case scenario. Jalen Hurts, Dak Prescott, they use the money from their signing bonus to buy a house and install a football field in their house. And then they have a whole sort of in-law suite or guest house that they erect just for their wide receivers to live with them. That's who you want. That's the guy. That's Jalen Hurts, right? That's Dak Prescott. That's what you want, ideally. I don't know if that's Caleb Williams or not. I don't know if he's talked about that or not. If someone would ask him that question, I would love to hear the answer. Uh, that's what I care about in terms of like, uh, you know, how they present themselves or what podcast they go on or who cares? 
right? Famously, John Elway refused to play for the Indianapolis Colts, right? And and he 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 basically created a, a crisis, a draft crisis for the NFL, right? And John Elway is a Hall of Famer. Things worked out just fine for John Elway. Thank you very much. And Caleb Williams has some John Elway to his game. So uh, whatever, man. Does he want to play for the Bears or not? That's his decision. Right? He has the power. He's that good. Like he can uh, lean on, uh, you know, leverage points behind the scenes to make it happen. Maybe, Maybe he wants to go. Maybe he wants to be a charger. And maybe Justin Herbert's going to be somewhere else. Think that's possible? I no. I mean, I, I I don't know. The whole Justin Herbert goes somewhere else. I don't know. I don't buy that one. I think Harbaugh's going to stick. Um, I wanted to get to one question. What about what read. Alan actually gave me one conspiracy that you know while we're talking, you know while while we're while we're while we're getting into it. What about the idea that Harbaugh wants to draft JJ McCarthy? I think. In his heart, he might like that, but I think at the end of the day, the what I think Harbaugh is going to end up doing is drafting about as many good offensive linemen and de- defensive linemen as he can, and he's going to. We're going to be sitting there together in the draft house in like three weeks, Matt, and we're going to be covering this full full NFL draft. And every time Los Angeles picks, we're going to say, "Okay, this is it. This is it. We're going to get a wide receiver." This is going to be so exciting. They're going to draft Malik Neighbors. Maybe they, they pass him up in the first round. We'll get to the second round. We're going to say, oh, maybe this is going to be Trey Benson or Roman Wilson or one of these wide receivers or running backs we like. And it's just going to be continual Harbaugh boringness. Offensive lineman, defensive lineman, offensive lineman, linebacker, defensive lineman, safety. And then we'll get on day three skill position, guys. I think that Harbaugh wants to reset the clock. I think he wants to have the best offensive line and defensive line in football. And he knows he has a really good quarterback in Justin Herbert who can do a lot with guys like Josh Palmer. And I think that's just kind of be the way it is. I, Greg Roman as the offensive coordinator, Jim Harbaugh as the coach. I, I don't have a whole lot of hope for them going away from the, the linemen. Uh, that's just kind of kind of my my feel my feeling. Yeah, and the thing question- with these coaches is give them a little bit of credit. I mean, yeah, he's uh, Harbaugh has some idiosyncrasies, that's for sure. But all college coaches and most professional coaches dream of coaching a quarterback like Justin Herbert. Okay. So I think he's going to be just fine and very happy with Justin Herbert. And so I don't, I don't see that. And also in the chat, thank you to uh, Hodo prime doing the quick math, $108 million. They'd be walking away from if they traded Justin Herbert, just in the, all the signing bonus dead cap that they've spent and invested on him. So that's not happening. So this is Alan. Once again, is just spinning old wives' tales. Like no, no one thinks that Herbert's going anywhere. Uh, it, just because, yeah, you know, Allen may, Allen himself may find that he's he's spending too much time in like the college football Reddit, and he needs to spend more time in the Dynasty Reddit where they, they they don't they don't tolerate that kind of nonsense. I'll tell you what they don't tolerate in the Dynasty Reddit though, Matt. As I I I love Dynasty Reddit. Like I'll go in there, I'll put some of my articles, and I'll. Occasionally, I'm gonna I'll put a question in to kind of gauge what the Dynasty Reddit is is thinking because I think there's a lot of really smart people on Dynasty Reddit that are active Dynasty managers. I I went in and and asked people uh, what they thought of this one Rashi Rice trade I made. Well, not really asking, but seeing if they're seeing other Rashi Rice trades because today we had a Sonic Truth podcast. Where we're going to talk about Rashi Rice, and uh, you know I have a Dynasty Life podcast. People were furious that I posted in the Dynasty Reddit instead of the Dynasty Reddit trades. So they do get annoyed if you post in the wrong in the wrong like segment. Uh, they get a little fired up on that. But good question here from Famous J. Uh, shout out to Famous J. Watches a lot of our pods. Is there any doubt in your mind that Buffalo is going to pick a wide receiver in the first round now? I think they regret not taking a, a receiver in the first round last year. I oh. think they, I think they absolutely reg- or waiting and wait, it, it, picking one earlier. Anyway, I think there were a bunch of receivers that went in the second round as well, like Jaden Reed, and they were like, uh, you know, they did all those things to remember the trade up to get uh, Kincaid, but right? they wanted to make sure that they leapfrogged Dallas. 
but then in doing so, then they then they then they got their offensive lineman later in the second round. I don't I don't know uh, uh, Cyrus. I don't know how he did. You know, do if he do if he had was was he a contributor last year from, yeah, believe, from Florida? I believe so, but I don't think they're upset about Dalton Kincaid. Dalton Kincaid, you know, had a number of of big time weeks for them. Or I, this- I, I, yeah, you're right. I think at one point in the season they they might have been regretting it, but then Kincaid turned it on so well. There's no way they. I think that they you know at they do look back on some passed up receivers and they're not going to let it happen. Question I think that chat. I think that's what's I think that's what's going on and they're perfectly positioned to take a receiver. It could be the number 4 receiver on their board because I I, I don't how many receivers do you have going in the first round. I think we I, I think we are confident that because of the speed that Xavier Worthy is going to go first round. Is it is it an is it a is it a a sort of a assumed, largely assumed, widely assumed that Brian Thomas and or Adonai Mitchell are going to go first round as well. I think that we're going to be right near the number for the record. A lot of the books have it at six and a half right now, and some have it juiced uh, where you'd have to pay up to get to six to you know to to take the to take the over. So it's going to be right near the record of seven. Well, who's the seventh receiver? Lad then? McCon- who's Lad the McCon- seventh McCon- receiver you think is going to leak in? Lad McConkey's, I think, a lock. I think Lad McConkey actually ends up at the end of the day is almost a safer bet to go in the first round than than uh, Adonai Mitchell, because I think oh. Lad McConkey, I think, is is NFL teams love Lad McConkey, and he's going to go right in that wheelhouse of like twenty three through thirty two range. Adonai, you could see it happening where teams like him, but he falls into like pick. You see this time and time again. You think about like where Michael Pittman Jr where T Higgins fell like in that first 10 picks of the second round, you could see that. Um, so I think it's going to be right near the number. And there is a scenario where you see kind of a cascade effect. And a couple of those teams at the end of at the, in the second round say, we've already seen six wide receivers selected. I want to trade into the back end of the second of the first round, make sure I get my guy. I don't want to mess around with having to wait for like Keon Coleman. So I'm going to say, uh, 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 it, uh, this is not bombastic. I think six would be like what I would bet money on, right. but I don't, I think it could be more. Let's, uh, Matt, and this is a fun, this- but this is a function of, this is a function of the, the, the salaries. These receivers are commanding. Yeah. It's like, right? that's, you that's what this, contract. that's what's going on. No, no one that's worth a damn in terms of ranking prospects. And you can go to our, you go to playerprofile.com, click on NFL draft and you can see, Matty Kiwum's NFL draft big board. That's who he believes are the best players in this draft. You know, going down the board. Who are the most valuable players? And I can tell you, he doesn't have many receivers in the first round outside the big three. It's the big three and then a handful of other guys. Xavier Worthy's in there. Brian Thomas is in there. But we're talking about pick 25 and beyond. Because you should be, if you're going for best value, you really should be looking at offensive line, cornerback. You should not be going after these these receivers outside the big three. Their bust risk is way too high, you know, when compared to the bust risk of, you know, a Kenyon Mitchell, right? You know, a, a, a Marius Mims, those guys, J.C. Lantham, uh, Braylon Trice, their their bust risk much lower. Than all the all those receivers and the wide receiver four through seven, but it's a function of what are these guys commanding in free agency and just NFL trends. That's why, like, it, it, I think it's, I think seven receivers going in the first round is absurd. The fact that the line is six and a half, I think, is crazy. But it's just where we are, and uh, so yeah, McConkey to the Bills would be bad for Shakir. Yes. Mitchell to the Bills would be bad for Shakir. On the other hand, I actually think that Brian Thomas is good for Shakir. I think Worthy is good for Shakir because they're more you know, lower target, bigger play players. And I think that fits better with Shakir. So Shakir, it's really a coin flip of uh, whether you know his value uh, you know, is sustained on draft day or not. One question here from Jesse uh, Kuiper or Cooper. I might be saying it incorrectly. I'll go with Kuiper. Kuiper. 
Queeper, Queeper, Queeper. Uh, is it Queeper? Uh, shout out to the chat. Theo, you uh, know what a queef is? Yes. This is getting a little Alan Soslowski like. We got to get the, I uh, got to get Alan on one of these AMAs. Well, we're uh, on Reddit, so. That's right. Uh, Jesse says, who do you think is going to get pushed out in Houston now that Diggs is there? I, I'm guessing which wide receiver uh, or another player loses the most value. You brought up uh, Dalton Schultz as the one that really gets nuked because his pathway to being you know, the number three target on the team goes way down, not only with the Diggs uh, addition, but also Mixon uh, with his receiving prowess out of the backfield. But I think people really want to know, Matt, what do you think, Nico Collins or Tank Dell, who loses the most uh, value? Oh, man, this is easy. Who do, who do you, who, 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 let me ask the chat. Let me ask Reddit. Who do you think, <laughs> right? Who do you think? Who do you think I'm going to say? It's easy, man. It's Nico Collins. It's Nico Collins. It's yeah, the it's... guy that didn't produce for two straight years in the NFL and then basically was producing at the Noah Brown level in the Noah Brown role for the offense. And this is what I've been saying for months. Uh, no one wanted to listen to me. They want to continue to draft Nico Collins. Uh, what, in the top 30 of single quarterback startups? In the top 50 of Superflex startups, late second round in best ball. <laughs> cool. Cool. But all along, the people in Texas know what he is, right? He's an outside clasher. He's a, a lesser Mike Williams. You know, Gabriel Davis. The, the, we've seen these kinds of guys. Like, they're going to go up and get it. They're going to have some big weeks against certain NFL corners when they're going up against the Colts. And they just the Texans had an inordinate number of games against incredibly weak secondaries. That's my only concern with CJ Stroud and why I would hesitate to put him at the 101 is I would like to see him put up a big season against a, a more difficult schedule. Yeah. And Nico awesome. Collins, uh, you know, benefited from all of that most. Tank Dell, on the other hand, is a five four wide receiver who is winning on the perimeter in the NFL as a rookie. That's way more impressive than anything Nico Collins has ever done. And that has earned, I think, the benefit of the doubt for Tank Dell that Nico Collins never had. So then now when you add a new alpha into the mix, okay, who has the benefit of the doubt? Who's more versatile? Who has a better connection with the quarterback? It's Dell, Dell, Dell down the board. So it's going to be more digs on the outside, more Dell inside. Dell is amazing inside. He's an amazing slot receiver. When you saw him take any any uh, snaps out of the slot, the senior bowl, like, I mean, it was over. I mean, RIP the linebackers, or the safety is trying to cover him. So, I mean, I love it. I, I love the, the talent configuration where you have the a proper Z. I mean, Stephon Diggs is a Z receiver like you built it in the lab. I mean, Jerry Rice, that, that, and then you have uh, Nico Collins playing like the John Taylor role. And then you've got a bonus slot receiver that the 49ers never had, you know, in during the Bill Walsh days, which imagine if Bill Walsh had a tank Dell, right? It would have been special. So I love that configuration where you can bomb it up when the matchup is right to Nico Collins. You always have digs on the right side and he and tank Dell can work off each other brilliantly. I mean, imagine I love the three receiver set where you have Nico on the left and you have a bunch formation on the right uh, of Schultz and uh, Diggs and Dell. And you're, you know, you're a secondary and you're trying to figure out how to get all those guys covered. Good luck. Yeah. It's uh, it's definitely a crazy, crazy day for this one. I agree with you. It's it's definitely Collins. And guys, also we have to factor in price. Nico Collins has passed Tank Dell by in terms of how much he cost you in dynasty startups and also in dynasty trades. And on underdog, Matt, Nico Collins rose up to wide receiver nine, where Tank Dell is at wide receiver 19. Both of them are going to take a, a, a step back. Um and Diggs, for that matter, I think is going to take a slight step back. They're all going to be a little bit more jumbled. But Tank Dell sort of had a 
this is the one you want to bet on long term. Tank Dell had a real connection with CJ Stroud. Tank Dell was immediately good in the NFL. We love seeing guys able to come in and do it as rookies. This Tank Dell and like CJ Stroud, people talked about how Stroud really wanted Dell uh, to be drafted by the Texans. The Texans drafted Dell for him. And Dell is also like the local kid from the University of Houston, came into Houston in the Houston Texans, ripped it up. Dell would have been a wide receiver one. I'm fully convinced if he never got hurt. This is a really good question here, Matt. We've talked about Bijan Robinson as a huge winner uh, in the new Atlanta offense with Zach Robinson as the offense coordinator. Uh, we have a, a trade question. This is a one quarterback, eight man league. Okay. So only eight teams in this league start nine players, DeAndre Swift and the one Oh two or Bijan Robinson. So you're talking about Malik neighbors and DeAndre Swift or Bijan Robinson. In an eight eight person league, yeah. Oh man, uh, an eight person league puts an ultra super premium on the most elite players because you know that the waiver wire is going to be stocked with guys you can stream every week, guys you can stream and probably get neighbors level production, right? Guys you can stream and definitely get Swift level production. Can you stream Bijan level production? I, no. I think it's the answer is probably Bijan. Probably just, in an eighteen, dude. Have you? Yeah, ever, it's eighteen it's, league. Eighteen it's league. All it's you're Bijan. doing is you're neighbors, chasing. Man. This is why this trade is even on the table, by the way, because somebody knows. Somebody in this league knows what wins in this league, and they're like, "You're just chasing the elite of elite, you know, gems to put in the crown." Right in a league like that. Josh Allen, B. John Robinson, Amon Ross St. Brown. It, when it comes down to it, you can count the number of running backs that can average 20 points per game next year on one hand, whereas Malik Neighbors, if he comes in and averages 15 points per game, that would be a real win for him as a rookie, and I think he could have that range of outcomes. But you're talking about B. John Robinson is probably a averaging six or seven points per game more than DeAndre Swift. DeAndre Swift probably 12, 13 points per game. Bijan 19 or 20. It's I think it's Matt's absolutely right. I think it's it's Bijan Robinson. We want to take just a couple more questions before we get out of here. Um, let's take one from Reddit. If this draft didn't have the top three wide receivers, how weak or strong would the wide receiver class be? Are Brian Thomas, Adonai Mitchell and Worthy projected late first in the NFL draft because it's where the talent says they belong or because the other wide receivers are pushing them down. I think that it's a little bit of both. Um, I think that there's a chance that if this draft was only, like if we took the big three out of it, I think there's a chance that somebody would reach for a Xavier Worthy or, or a Brian Thomas. Um, and those guys might go similar draft capital to last year, maybe a little bit higher than we saw. Last year, we saw pretty much everybody drafted like pick 20 and 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 below, and all four of them went in like a cluster. I think at the end of the day, Brian Thomas is a good enough athletic performance and a big enough performance in the SEC that maybe somebody takes him off the board closer to a pick 11 or 12 than probably like the 15 through 20 he's going in. But Matt, do you have anything to add on that one? Well, I looked at Reddit, and there's an interesting dichotomy here of uh, someone who's really bullish on you and then it thinks that I'm like a, the guy to ask uh, or bearish on you, I should say. Another guy is very bullish on you. There you go. So we have Solani1 who says, is Theo turning into Muzio, someone who used to be honest but is now just using their large platform to sway the markets for huge profit margins? What is that? No, no, guys, I'm not. Is I'm this not, conspiracy I, that we have people that are trying to sway markets in quotes? Dynasty <laughs> pump you, and dump? For, yes, yes. Theo, the, Theo the, 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 what they don't know is like you and Billy play fantasy for fun. Yes, there's money at stake, but your your livelihood is not fantasy football. It's a fun thing. Um, so no, you're not devising schemes to like, you know, marginally improve profit margins for money. Like, I, trust me, Billy and Theo are not motivated by money 
in this situation. Yes, money is like a scoreboard, of course, but that's not it, man. That's not it. So the, the elaborate schemes these people construct that are losing to better players in their fantasy leagues is always amusing to hear what kind of, uh, uh, you know, fake scenarios they construct. But then, but, but the guy comes back, same guy comes back and asks me Waddle or Nico and Bateman. And I'm like, if you're asking me that question, you're not paying attention because, you know, I, I wired a question yesterday on the mind of mansion show, uh, to Scott Connor and uh, Clay Mosley asking them, Hey, what's a young receiver that could, you could break 20 points could, could be this year's CD lamb, you know, who, who maybe had a couple of years of, you know, under producing and, and the, the correct answer I was looking for with Jalen Waddle and Scott said Jalen Waddle as his second, second choice. So that was an easy one to, uh, they were like, well, I can't say Drake London. I'm like, yes, you're right. I, I, other than Drake London, right? That was, that's why I should have prefaced it with that. And then the answer, boom, correct for Scott Connor. It is Jalen Waddle because anything can happen. You want me to send you a list of all the injuries that befell NFL wide receivers last year, right? That's all it takes, right? You take a, a, a an undersized, you know, 30 plus year old wide receiver that relies on speed and athleticism to win. And you think nothing can happen to that guy throughout the course of a season that would open up huge opportunity for Jalen Waddle and allow him to be a 20 plus fantasy points per game wide receiver. Uh, I'd be surprised if it doesn't happen. Right, just based on the probability of injury and how things how things work out. The only problem with Jalen Waddle is, uh, which is uh, Tua Tungavailoa, right? But that didn't stop Tyreek Hill. Tua didn't stop Tyreek Hill from twenty three fantasy points a game last year. So that's such a slam dunk that I don't even know why he asked that. So shame on shame on Sol- Solani one. This guy's still this guy's still attacking me. He says um, somebody said. This one says, Theo, you are great and enjoy listening to the things I'm on, but please do more without the pod father. Well, that was the next one. And that was the, that guy, was the flip side. And then one this... guy that's praising you and another guy that's, that's calling you a shill. Yeah. Uh, and and it, it, it is trying to, you know, quote unquote, manipulate markets. I mean, guys, if you want to point out some some uh, this guy says that that you are honest with your info. But this year I'm hyping crap all day, guys. Oh, yeah, they're I, not, they're coming after you. This guy Alan, Solani Alan, won. The thing is, Tamu Solani for anyone that played like NHL '94, '95, uh, was the was such an unbelievable weapon for the Winnipeg Jets. So for this guy to take Tamu Solani's name and then to just disparage it with this, uh, you know, the you know blatant slander of Theo Greminger, it's embarrassing. He should be ashamed of himself. And Biscuit Bean, who is saying that I talk over you, I talk a lot. I have a lot to say. But do you feel like you've been talked over today, Theo? No, not at all. I think Matt and I actually have a, a strong rapport. Uh, Matt is a, is a, is a, it takes a little getting used to to podcast with you, but we've podcasted together so many times that it's like the back of my hand. And I think I have a general feeling of when, you want to talk about your stuff. And I think that we, it, and also I'll say this for people who listen to Sonic truth. It's difficult to podcast th- with three people. Like a lot of podcasts are solo or two, but doing a three person podcast, there's always going to be kind of interruptions. But I think for, you know, I think it's that the Sonic truth and also our friends at dynasty trades and five do a really good job of doing a three person podcast where we have a, a a pretty large following and three people kind of getting their voices heard. So, yeah, I don't know about this whole pump and dump thing. I didn't know that I had that reputation. But I want to answer Jared Dean's question. What am I doing with JSN? JSN, I moved one JSN share this year in an FFPC league. I moved JSN and TJ Hawkinson to get the 106 and Dalton Kincaid. It gave me a lot of flexibility. I ended up moving that 106 um, and did another trade. Down the line, I ended up getting a couple more things, but single I, QB. I, I'm a single Q, single QB. So it was sort of a JSN re-roll, but it was FFPC where I had the flexibility of the basically in FFPC because of the roster cutdowns, having a pick versus a player is also like getting a free roster spot. So my other JSN shares, I turned down the 110 in a single QB league for him the other day. 
I've turned down like those sort of like late first round uh, offers for him. If somebody wants to offer me like the 105, I think I'm probably doing it, but I'm not, I still believe that he's going to be a good NFL producer and I'm not looking to get out of him just because of old target competition with Tyler Lockett and the fact that, you know, he didn't do as well as rookie season as I thought. We really liked him as a, as a, uh, a prospect and I think that he will do it. What else do we got here? Uh, let's let's get I one mean, or two more can, questions. Can I can I give you a fun stat on uh, on Jackson Smith and Jigba? Jackson Smith and Jigba only had two games last year with fifty or more air yards. I know. There's some red flags there, Matt. I mean, Jesus I think that Christ re-rolling JSN. <laughs> if you're if you're risk averse, uh, this is your window to to get rid of JSN. And and re-roll JSN for one of these rookies in this class. I'll I'll turn it back to you, Matt. If JSN was in this class, you would have him as wide receiver four, correct? Sure. Okay. So I, yeah, and I don't think like the it's not like JSN was completely a zero his rookie season. I also think JSN. That missing that time in the preseason did hurt him because he missed. He basically had a lost year the year before with injury. Then he comes in, does the mini camps. Well, he broke his wrist. Broke his wrist and had to get surgery in Remember the summer. He broke his wrist. Yeah. So that I think that hurt him. Yeah. So um, I'm. I think this is about fair value for JSN. Where I, I'm not going to move him for the 110, 111, 112. I would consider moving him if I think I get like a Brian Thomas, just because the re roll is there. Um, let's take one or two more. I know Matt, we said an hour. Well, one thing I'll say is DK Metcalf. I know that, that, that was a, that was a proposed, uh, choice for, you know, young receiver that has 20 point upside out of nowhere. DK Metcalf, certainly explosive, certainly has the air yards. If you love air yards, you love DK Metcalf. I worry about DK Metcalf. DK Metcalf strikes me as a type of player who has been, basically getting by was outproduced by AJ Brown in college. Remember, right. And his whole life, he's been getting by on this extreme athleticism. Uh, and then you know, sort of flagrantly flaunting his lack of any kind of nutritional uh, awareness. Loves candy. Right. And strength and conditioning, just letting it happen. These guys, they go poof. DK Metcalf. When he turns 29, 30, mark my words, record this podcast, stream, AMA, DK Metcalf's going to go poof. And it's going to happen so fast because of, of, of the, 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 the leaning on the physical traits and gifts. And it could happen at a shockingly early age. It could happen even at age 28. Where you're like, what's going on with DK Metcalf? Right? When we, yeah. So it's possible, not probable, but possibly he's one of those guys that's on my red flag list. One of my early alert system, do, 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 do. he's my, on my early alert system for guys that I think are going to age very poorly. And he's now getting into that window. The window is now shifted given how old he is, where now you have to start looking at what do you think you're going to get out of this guy at age 27, 28, 29? Uh, and that needs to start becoming part of your calculus. You know that Lockett's now in his 30s. So, it, and because they drafted Lockett, they're not going to draft another receiver. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 because they drafted Jackson Smith and Jigba, they're not going to draft another receiver. So, I think in a couple of years here with, with Jackson Smith and Jigba has clear skies in order for takeoff. Yeah, I mean... I'm 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 with you on that. And then Robert in the chat says uh Flowers over JSN. I I would make that switch. I would go Zay Flowers. Well, potentially. yeah. Yeah, but again Wait, wait, that's not the debate. J Zay Flowers is phenomenal. Zay Flowers is is going to go down as a better receiver than any of the other receivers in that class. Better than Rashi Rice, better than all these guys, better than Tank Dell as a pure NFL wide receiver who can get open in any given situation, who has explosive speed, yards after the catch, all these things. 
It's just that he's never going to be on a prolific offense. He's never going to be high volume. And they're going to have Mark Andrews there for the foreseeable future. So he's going to be, you know, the one, a one B receiver in a low volume offense. So the upside's capped. No one says, no one thinks it's not, I don't, I don't even know how you do it. Right. If you have a mobile quarterback, that's going to run a lot and the volume is going to be low. You have to have a lot of yards after the catch. You have to basically do what DJ Moore did last year, but DJ Moore didn't come close to 20 fantasy points a game. It's not going to happen. So you got to be paired with a Joe Burrow. You got to be paired with a, with a Kirk cousins, uh, a Dak Prescott, if you want to get up into that zone. And that's the problem with Zay flowers. You put Zay flowers, you have him switch. To, let's say Zay flowers and, and CD lamb switch places. Right. Yeah. That's then it becomes a conversation who you'd rather have a hundred percent. Um, I want to take one quick comment in the chat where a couple of people have called me out on this, the Troy Franklin. Why did I plant my flag on Troy Franklin? So I, when we start doing rookie content months before the, the NFL combine, we're getting a little bit of an incomplete picture. So I think some people are kind of using this as like a, Hey, gotcha moment. I still really like Troy Franklin, but Troy Franklin became less likely to be a first round wide receiver in the NFL draft, which sort of makes his profile a little less sterling than before the combine. So like, I still really like Troy Franklin, but I make adjustments to my rankings when I get more and more information coming in. So big country, I don't think, I don't know if this was like a gotcha or what did I like about Troy Franklin? I love the production at Oregon. And I do think he's going to be a productive player in the NFL. I just think it's such a strong wide receiver class that me moving Troy Franklin down closer to like wide receiver eight from wide receiver four or five is not like a, you know, it's not like I'm torpedoing him. It's just a really, really good class. What are you talking about? People wide like, receiver four is wide open. Wide receiver four. Wait, get, let's hear big countries. Big wide country. receiver rankings. Let's see big oh, countries no, wide I receiver think rankings not a, three months not, ago. Yeah. Let's see big countries wide receiver rankings a month ago. Let's see them now. Let's see them after the draft. Let's see no, them during not, the not season. Not a gotcha. Big country was just curious what I what I liked about. Let's Troy see. Let's see the. I want to see. I want to see the rankings. This is a very. This is the most challenging wide receiver class to rank we've ever seen. Okay. So there's no. There's really no reason to even explain the reason why. And I, th I think this is pretty self-evident. The reason why you would have Troy Franklin in your top five is because he had top five metrics. Yeah. By the numbers, he's a top five receiver. Okay. Period. Then he goes to the combine and has the sloppiest, you know, drills of any of the wide receivers. Right. Then his, his hand size comes in. New measurements, new data comes in and you adjust, right? Last time I checked, Troy Franklin was putting up splash play after splash play in college. You can't tell me, oh, I looked at his tape and I saw how sloppy he was. I mean, okay, show me. He wasn't commanding targets at a rate that, you know, was you know, exceptional, right? Especially in these big games where he like, oh, he, you know, he, he's playing a little bit of a Jekyll and Hyde season. And that's a, that can be a giveaway that a guy lacks the refinement, you know, when he, when, if he struggles against the higher level competition in college, and that's what we saw with Troy Franklin, that's a clue that, okay, we might have some refinement issues. And then the combine happens and the reports from Maddie Kiwum, who was there is like, sorry guys, like, uh, I love Franklin and I, I love the metrics, but geez, this is a sloppy dude. Yeah, and I'll say this. Um, I still think Troy Franklin is going to be really good as a deep threat in the NFL. Like, that's one thing that I think he's very talented at. And I, I think that he's going to be drafted in the second round. So we've seen a lot of these guys kind of have big-time success not going in the first round. I think Troy Franklin will be a second-round pick. I still like him, but like Matt said, it, it could have been – there was a lot, like, left to be desired. Also, we wanted him to be a little bit faster on that frame where – he was supposed to be a full tenth of a second faster. Yeah, and we saw Xavier Worthy be super skinny and blazing. Yeah, and then Troy Franklin was supposed to be four three, and gives us like a, a over four four, where that doesn't really matter for most wide receivers. But when you're in the hundred and seventy pound range at his height, it's certainly there's there's some hurdles for him to overcome. That being said, I will have some Troy Franklin 
but it's going to be more likely when I can get him in like second yeah. rounds of my rookie draft. I'm not going to reach for him. The combine does a great job. Yeah, in big country, I'm 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 messing with you, buddy. Like it's you don't have to send me your rankings. We know you're cool. Yeah, like, you're worry. cool. Big country. Don't worry, we're cool. <laughs> but the bottom line is, the combine is great because it does help you to because it's such a it's such a razor thin margin that these guys are are on, where one guy runs a four three seven, that can make the difference between you being, uh, you know, having a a big year, right? Like what's an example of a guy who, who ran, who ran faster than we thought ran like in the four, three, three, four, 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 three, five. And we're like, Oh wow. This guy's actually, uh, you know, uh, what you, something you would classify as elite speed as opposed to just fast. Right. Because the difference between being Marquise Brown and being DD Westbrook is, the margins are very, I mean, we're talking about a 10th of a second in the 40, right? That can mean all the difference at the NFL level. And so there's always at the combine. There's a couple of guys that are exposed as having the DD Westbrook risk. And I think that's what happened with Troy Franklin. where are like, man, I think that I'm, we're just seeing way too much DD Westbrook here. That's a bummer. Right. Just in terms of, Hey, this guy just doesn't quite have the explosiveness. It's a great parallel to some of the, the the some of the best players in League Two and League One in the English Football League, uh, if they were faster, they would also be elite producers uh, in the Premiership. But a guy like Paul Mullen, who's the you know the the the, the renowned Wrexham, uh, you know number ten, he has everything in his game, everything at a high level. Like he's a nine out of ten at everything except speed he's fucking slow okay so he goes from being a great premier league player to being a great league two player based on one trait and one trait alone separation and ability that's it right and the problem is a guy a guy's game like troy franklin the problem is that tenth of a second that four four three versus four three three that can mean the difference of a 900 yard season in the NFL versus, you know, being a total bust. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Well, let's take, uh, we'll take one more question. We said this would be an hour. We're already at almost an hour and 15. A big shout out to the chat. The chat is lit here on YouTube. We're still going to answer your Reddit questions uh, when we get off the air. But if you have another question, get it in now. Um, and we'll see you back next week. And also, highly recommend. Uh, checking out Matt's uh, Mind of Mansion yesterday. You had the guys from Dynasty Trades and Five on. That's right. It's a good one. Guys, last chance. One more question in the chat. What if the Pac-12 has really terrible defenses, which explains Troy Franklin, but also, unfortunately, Caleb Williams? I think that... I don't know. This is, I don't know. I think it's a little bit of conspiracy theory. I've heard this from Matty Kiewum bringing up, namely the Oregon Ducks, because we saw a disappointment from Bucky Irving and Troy Franklin uh, at the combine for both of those guys running a little bit slower than maybe we saw on, on film. But at the same, at the same, uh, you know, argument guys, we're high. The, the, a number of these other PAC 12 guys are, going to be highly drafted and I think we're not fading the athletic the athleticism was completely there for Roma Dunze athleticism was completely there for Marshawn Lloyd uh Caleb Williams I think is a is a generational quarterback prospect I truly believe he's going to be like a top 10 producer next year in the NFL so I'm not I don't have a Pac-12 bias but guys we don't have to worry about the Pac-12 anymore they're all going to be in the Big 10 next year so we'll see how these Pac-12 teams do uh, with the the upgraded uh, competition, but he's uh, just worried that the, the the level of competition you know made uh, was, was sort of like Big Twelve like you know from from the past like what you know Baker Mayfield inflating those stats you know Graham Harrell that's what that's what he's talking about I understand that uh, I think we've evaluated uh, on you know John Lobb I believe you know the the great John Lobb not to be confused with Dylan Lobb uh, no relation no relation John Lobb. Spell different. John Lobb 
uh, no relation. Uh, you know, very s- similar humans, though. Very similar. I think they similar football, similar forty yard dashes. Similar football skill sets. Yes. Yes. Uh, he he thinks Caleb Williams is generational to the point that he would take him over we, the top wide receivers in this class in single quarterback leagues. Yes. I wouldn't, but. When someone who knows things is that bullish on a player, I stay. That's what we do. We bring in veterans and young people to coexist in this network, to write articles and to be on shows, you know, all the time on this channel. And and John Lobb writes some super insightful pieces. He knows things. And that wasn't a cue to me to draft Caleb Williams in the top five in single quarterback. But it was a cue that like, oh, I need to take Caleb Williams very seriously as a rookie year difference maker, potentially. And, you know, where and 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 lock him into the Bears, you know, whatever they do. Do you think the Bears are going to end up drafting him even though he doesn't want to go to the Bears? Yes. They will. Of course they will. Yeah. It's not. It's, it's so I, I think that there is a lot of people that want Caleb Williams to fail because he's not the robo quarterback that they're used to right with the with the the cliche answer to the questions and the cliche aesthetic and everything else uh and so they're reading more into this than they that I think that he has some preferences but you know this I think his agent's going to actually sit down with him and go down the roster and I think he's going to learn very quickly studying the bears over the next couple weeks. Oh, this is a team I want to be on. Right. That my, my, I, I think that he's going to the bears and, and he's not going to block it because he wants to win and he wants weapons and he wants a great offensive line. He wants a, a franchise being built the right way. And that is the bears. And I, I, I do believe that efficient information will get through to him uh, and he'll end up there. And it's a great situation to be in on the Bears with, the, with with DJ Moore. Oh yeah, I mean with Cole Komet, I'm you. You gotta love it, man. And they could be taking Roma Dunze or an offensive lineman at nine as well. They're gonna if they that draft offense. another offensive lineman. Yeah. Oh, Matt, God. let's take this one question in the chat because communication breakdown's been very active. Laporta versus Ferguson versus Kincaid. How are you ranking them in dynasty? And then let's take a follow up question. Okay, is, well, uh, that's easy. First, I want to say Ferguson's not good, so just take Ferguson off. The Fergusons and the Schultz, when the situation is right, they're going to be good. When they're needed to win a playoff game or a game that really matters, like Dalton Schultz, he's going to absolutely fade into oblivion and cost his team the game like he did the Cowboys a couple of years ago, not dragging his foot, not getting upfield. We all know what happened. You throw to him, you lose. That's what happens with non-difference making tight ends that are just there to, to to take default targets. That's what Ferguson is. That's what Schultz is. And there's a handful of guys like that around the league. And that's why I don't have any of those guys in Dynasty because they get vaporized when what happened to Schultz just happened today. Right. I'll say- so th- then the question is Kincaid versus Laporta. And that's pretty easy because Laporta is in the best possible situation, uh, given that it's a pocket passer who's prolific as opposed to more of a mobile passer. And I don't think that whenever you have Josh Allen, if you're not the number one target, you know, there's more weekly target share risk. And the fact that you could have a bunch of unlucky games stack up in a row to have a bad year. Like the, I think there's vol. I think Kincaid with Allen is going to be volatile his entire career. He's going to be tight end two. Then he's going to be tight end seven. It's, it's going to happen. Okay. And that's just because the way the weeks shake out uh, and injuries and all those things. Whereas Laporta, like he's the number two receiver there for the foreseeable future. And yeah. he did things we've never seen before. So of course he's number one, then Kincaid. Uh, and, and then, I mean, to even, I don't even mention I, I, those guys in the Ferguson in the same breath as those guys. It's just, it's embarrassing. You can't okay. do that. I'm not even going to, I'm, I'm going to say it's Laporta, Kincaid, and then nameless, faceless, whoever tight end number three. I'm not even going to use his name. Okay. I'll, I'll say, I do think situation matters a little bit with when it comes to Ferguson. And we've seen 
you brought up you brought up Dalton Schultz. Schultz had a tight end three season with Dak Prescott. Dak Prescott continually elevates his tight ends. It's a great situation for Jake Ferguson. Uh, I think you know I've heard you and Andrew Cooper and a couple of other people being critical of Ferguson as a talent. I do think that if you need a tight end in Dynasty, there are a lot of people thinking they're selling at the peak of Ferguson. Guy got a lot of red zone targets, Matt. He got a lot of targets this year, um, and that was standing next to the wide receiver one, Caleb Williams. Want to get one more opinion on a tight end from you is, and I actually had Cole Komet in my buy low uh, tight end uh, dynasty, buy low targets. You can look at it on playerprofiler.com. Just dropped maybe like about a week ago on playerprofiler.com. But Cole Komet is interesting because Keenan Allen was added to Chicago. DJ, DJ Moore is locked in. DeAndre Swift gets added. And now Cole Komet, who was a top eight tight end last year and had over 70 catches last year, over 700 yards receiving, over 70 catches, he's sort of become this like push away afterthought. The, the, general, uh, the general consensus is he's the one that's going to lose the most with Caleb Williams taking over at quarterback. I don't know. I think Cole Komet is actually has a little bit more long-term stability than some people are giving him credit for. Your thoughts on Komet before we get out of well, here? Well, the Bears don't have like a super electric satellite back. Their best pass catcher is 220 pounds and Roshan Johnson. Okay. Right. I mean, DeAndre Swift was used as a between-the-tackles runner last year. No, I know DeAndre. I'm kidding. DeAndre Swift is the better receiver. I know. I'm joking. But I mean, it's, it's, it, it could even, it, it wouldn't be crazy. It wouldn't be crazy. Roshan Johnson catches more passes than DeAndre Swift. Wouldn't shock me next year. Bottom line is they don't have a – who's the wide receiver three there? I think it's going to be TBD in Chicago who exactly. the wide receiver three is. Yeah. yeah. It, like there's, there's no, no loyalty three. to like the Vilas Joneses of the world. Yeah, there's no like Theo Riddicks. There's no – St. Brown maybe. I don't know. Yeah, there, there's – there's 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 <laughs> come on. Equanimius? So there's no wide receiver three of consequence. There's no like, uh, you know, woodhead out of the backfield type of guy, right? So yeah, that that tells me that you're just talking, if, if it's consolidated down to three, they better go, if they're going to sign Keenan Allen, they better go offensive lineman in the first round. Just protect the hell out of Caleb Williams. That is the move. And then you're down to three receivers. You're down to three th receivers that is a nice consolidated target share more volume than anyone expects because Caleb Williams is going to be better than anyone expects. Cole Komet actually has nice size adjusted athleticism, unlike a guy like Ferguson, but isn't there a guy that's even cheaper? Who's in a similar situation? Name him. A conk I I'm Jake? not on the, I'm not, I'm not on chick. I'm not on chick. I mean, I, I have some chicken dynasty I actually bought him super cheap last week on a dynasty team. Shout out to the people on Reddit who think I'm like pumping and dumping. I got Chig super cheap in an FFPC league, but I don't know. I think the pathway for for Chig, it's they add Calvin Ridley, who's a big time red zone target magnet. He had a ton of red zone targets last year. DeAndre Hopkins is still still a threat in the red zone, and then you have out of the backfield now two running backs who can catch the ball. I think Chig's pathway is just a little bit more touchdown dependent, and now in terms of red zone targets, I think it's going to go down a little bit. Chig, we had that. It's Chig is almost like a dynasty lesson where he steamed up so much. You could have traded Chig Aconquo for Trey McBride uh, last offseason in a lot of dynasty leagues. I think that's uh, it's a good lesson for us all to uh, to remember. Uh, Jared Dean shouting out Tra Traylon Burks as a uh, moving into the slot. Yeah, there's more going to be more target competition next year in Tennessee. Matt, let's quickly get your thoughts on Michael Mayer. I'm bullish on him. He was also in my my uh, dynasty targets. Not really a buy low, but I think he's you're going to buy him for lower than you would next offseason because I think we're finally going to see sort of a breakout year in Las Vegas. Yeah, Michael Mayer is a great one. That's even better than Chig because the Raiders could upgrade the quarterback position. So if the Raiders upgrade the quarterback position, now all of a sudden Mayer is a discount version of Cole Komet and a, a, a higher probability of a breakout than Chig Conquo because he has the has the better draft capital was the, you know, the Mr. Football at Notre Dame. 
he had a couple weeks last year. I mean, he was highly inconsistent. He wasn't Laporta. Like, Laporta Kincaid have left him in the dust. I get it. But it's possible all these guys, all these guys have big years. It's possible we have four big years, if not more, from last year's tight end class. It's that good of a tight end class. I believe and, we called it a transformative class last yeah. year on the Sonic Truth uh, podcast before the NFL draft. We Bottom line is, to... if Mayer in a different year it, where he was the tight end one, the clear tight end one, he would have been in many years back through time. Everyone would be expecting the, the step forward because, oh, tight ends, they take time to develop. And he was the best tight end in the class. And it's just a matter of time and, and buy low and all these things. But he gets so washed under the Musgraves and the and now with Laporta and Kincaid, everyone fixated on those guys. And then also there was a great comment on Reddit that was made earlier. Seems like many, many years ago. Now we've been on this show uh, streaming here. I told you we get you out of here by three, Matt. We, yeah, uh, whatever, yeah. whatever. Uh, and so it's my own fault. I talk too much as the, again, more complaints about that. That's right. So, uh, the the question was, you know, is this is this new influx of tight end at the wide at the tight end position making the tight end position actually less valuable, where fantasy points are less scarce? And of course, that's supply and demand. That's economics one hundred and one. That if all twelve teams have a tight end that they're happy with, then of course the demand for tight end talent and tight end fantasy points is going to go down in your league's trade market. That's how it works. So that is an interesting side effect of last year's tight end class which is interesting but i think that there would be much more of an assumption that this is it's all happening for michael mayer this year had he not been you know compared relentlessly to the the big breakout tight ends from last year yeah no for sure i think mayer is going to have a, a nice breakout season i uh, want to give a big shout out to the chat matt let everybody know what you have coming up uh, down the line um podcast wise next week and Maybe talk a little bit about our draft coverage down in Detroit. We have the the big draft guide coming out. Uh, yes. You know, T minus, you know, three to five days, this thing is dropping. So get our draft guide on playerprofiler.com. Theo has invested an incredible amount of time uh, with all the rookie analysts, Matty Kiwoon, John Lobb, so many people, Dan Williamson contributing, big time analysis, player profiler data, comps rankings from all these different experts uh for rookie drafts i mean it's incredible it's uh we're taking it to a complete new level this year with a rookie guide that's exciting and then we're going to be live in detroit streaming every pick and it's going to be a very fantasy focused uh draft coverage every moment of the nfl draft we're going to talk it through talk all the picks through live cody carpenter alex dunlap josh larkey myself theo many more yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be absolutely awesome, um, guys. We're gonna be back here uh, early next week. We've been doing these uh, usually on Mondays, but check Player Profiler Twitter, check my own Twitter. We're gonna be announcing when these when these AMAs are gonna be next week. Look for uh, either Matt, myself, Dario Ofstein, Josh Larkey. We've been having a number of people. Uh, Evan Ringler came on one of them. Uh, so we're we're doing this every single week. Get your questions in on Reddit. Get your questions in right here on YouTube, and uh, we will see you soon.